Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Network. I'm Bill Kennedy with the Alabama Department of Public Health. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Ethical Issues in the Age of COVID-19, Part 2. If you have a question during about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can leave a message there as somebody is monitoring it. Also, the handouts and evaluations are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Uh, continuing education credits have been approved for nurses, dietitians, and social workers for this program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you're watching this program on demand and want to receive a social work CE certificate, you will need to complete the social work test and send it in, along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you're watching this program live, there is no social work test required. For social workers, if you're watching this program live, it does qualify for classroom hours. If you're watching on demand, it is considered non-classroom hours. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, James Sacco, consultant to the Alabama Department of Public Health. Uh, Jim has been with us for, uh, I guess, uh, the last two and a half months. We've done, uh, this is our sixth presentation with, uh, with Jim uh, related to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, welcome, Jim. I know you have a lot of important information to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started with your presentation. Great. Good morning, everybody. Bill, thank you very much. Uh, it is a, a, a pleasure to be back. This is the last in the scheduled series. So for those of you who have been uh, painstakingly going through all six, the torture is over. The torture will be over at 1130 Central Time. Uh, I, I'm delighted to have been asked what we've done. For those of you who haven't been part of it, we've done a series of, of, of trainings on uh, sort of the, the psychosocial implications of, of COVID and, and some issues for special populations. And then because so many of us need ethics hours, uh, I've, I've uh, uh, put together a, a, a opportunity for us to think about what some of the ethical issues are we're facing in the age of, of COVID-19. Um, I, um, our, our goal is, as I said in the last, uh, the last uh, session, is to just look at the ethical issues in, in this, this time. What I did last time, I, I used some social work language, so nurses and PAs and, and dietitians, bear with me. Uh, but part of how I divided the course is last week, we talked about some of the big picture social issues that we're all facing, ethically facing. Uh, and, and in social work speak, we talk about those as macro issues. And uh, today I'll touch on those, but really we are talking about some of the ethical issues that arise in the one-on-one -on -one provision of, of uh, services to, to clients. Um, what's important is I, I didn't do last week's talk or two weeks ago. I didn't do the previous talk just to um, uh, just as a as a academic exercise. I think those big picture issues, the things we see on the news, the things that are uh, part of our discourse of, about the pandemic, do advise what happens to the person who's there with you uh, in the in the room in the exam room or, uh, and maybe more importantly today, with you via digital media. Part of what we're doing today, we had questions last time about uh, use of, of digital media. I know a number of people are now working remotely, providing all or some of your services uh, remotely. And so part of what we'll do today is sort of think about uh, implications for how we practice, ethical implications for how we practice uh, using uh, the, the digital tools that many of us are using. So those are objectives, kind of thinking about uh, how to resolve the ethical issues, some thoughts about how to uh, settle some of the, the questions that we have using uh, guidance. I, I, I'm, I'm really relying heavily on the NASW code of ethics. I, I did in, in uh, uh, preparing for this, I did look at the uh, nursing, uh, American Nursing Association code of ethics and there are a number of overlaps, and so I didn't want to jump back and forth. And then I know a number of dietitians and 
PA is I didn't, I didn't want to keep jumping back and forth. It looked to me as I just scanned uh, other disciplines that majority of what uh, we uh, uh, propose as ethical practice uh, for those of us who are social workers does relate to uh, other disciplines. And, and then issues about privacy. We had questions at the end of uh, session one, what about HIPAA, what about uh, patient confidentiality in the age of COVID-19 and, and particularly working remotely. So, um, so yeah, so that that's uh, what we hope to cover. Each time I've done this, I've done four or five slides to give us a, a, a brief update on what's going on. I, I know people know that, but but again, uh, I think that the issues that we deal with one-on-one -on -one are impacted by what's going on globally. And I just wanna kind of ground us in what's going on around us as we prepare to think about um, what's uh, what the implications are in terms of your one-on-one -on -one practice. So what I did today, I've, I've done this several ways in terms of a surveillance update. Um, what I did today is I went back to the first talk that I gave early uh, this summer, and I compare where we were in terms of surveillance data on the 10th of June and where we were this week on Wednesday when I finalized these slides. So um, above the dotted line, what you'll see is the change in cases in the eight weeks that, this is national data, the eight weeks that uh, have gone on between the first uh, training on COVID-19 that a Alabama Department of Public Health sponsored and where we were at Wednesday and uh, below the dotted line looks like since we started this conversation, more than 40,000 Americans have died from COVID-19 uh, in that eight week period. Um, I think if there is good news in this slide and I'm, I'm stretching because uh, there's a lot that I would call bad news in this slide. If there's good news, I do believe that we're better at, even in the, the eight weeks that I'm discussing, I think we've gotten better at clinical care, how to respond to, to COVID, uh, even in an acute care setting and um, how, to, how, to, uh, how to avoid, uh, we're better at keeping people alive uh, is the good news. That said, uh, for those who um, want to, ignore uh, the need to take precaution. I don't think that should give us too much uh, reassurance because what we also have learned is the chronic nature of some of the symptoms, the cardiac, neurological, uh, respiratory, uh, long lasting implications of COVID. And we, we only have six months of study, so we don't really know, but it appears that for people, even with mild cases, there are lasting, um, uh, systemic issues that that uh, that stay with people uh, that, that are part of the long-term consequence. So uh, finally, some good news about Alabama. I've been with you eight weeks hoping to get some good news. Um, what we know is that uh, early states that opened up saw a surge, uh, Alabama, Arizona. Uh, I would add to this list states that aren't really pulling back, Georgia, Florida, um, Louisiana to some degree, but but um, the good news is that that uh, states that were early April, early May were saying, let's uh, have restaurants, let's have public gatherings, let's uh, saw that surge early this summer, and a number, including the great state of Alabama, have reverted back to mandatory mask wearing, uh, more restrictive social distancing, uh, restrictions on how many people, and uh, you know after a very scary. Uh, time in midsummer, these states are seeing a decline in cases. I, I can't help but think it is a return to those restrictive uh, prevention measures that's contributed to that. Again, mask wearing, number of people uh, uh, who who can who can gather at public gatherings, and and I think bars bars and restaurants. I mean, I no nobody wants to go out and have a drink Friday night more than me, and yet it is just not safe in the United States of America. Uh, to go into a nightclub, go into a setting without a mask. I, I will, I will uh, put a stake in the ground and say it is not safe anywhere in America to go into a bar with 30, 40, 100 people tonight uh, without your mask on. And probably uh, with 100 people, it's not safe because of the number of people. Um, if, if I were to talk about what's going on globally, 
I've done several iterations of this. The, the, the worst news um, I think that I bring is the, the outbreak in Brazil, uh, horrifying outbreak in Brazil, um, largely, I mean, uh, especially impacting uh, lower, lower socio socioeconomic uh, uh, neighborhoods in big cities in Brazil, devastating uh, parts of Brazil. Uh, and what's happened is the countries that surround Brazil have seen their own explosion again in the same way that if one state said we're we're not going to be careful and other states around it or the state that said we're going to be careful but the states around it weren't being as careful uh, just a reminder about the porousness of borders and in South America again as, as uh, I was getting ready for this talk the the country surrounding Brazil and South America continues to be a, a significant uh, uptake in Russia in, in, in terms of cases. And many people question how honest uh, the Russians are in terms of sharing surveillance data, but it certainly appears even from the data that has been shared as if there's a, a significant increase in prevalence and, and more concern about India where just billions of people are at risk and, and rapid growth, again, largely in urban settings in India. But, but when I look this week at, at uh, hot spots for global growth, these, these countries rise to the top. Um, what's not new, I'm hardly want to, not sure what to say, but the political nature of COVID-19. Bill was sharing a story that somebody he knew was, was out uh, recreational and, and got into a, a shouting, people shouting to take off their masks when they were out in public. Uh, you know, that unfortunately, uh, what what is, I think, a pretty clear public health issue has become a sort of us versus them issue. There's no other way to say it. And unfortunately, um, I, I think I would argue deepened our already enormous political divide in this country. Uh, the last reminder there, I've spoken about this before, we don't have it quantified yet. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly uh, how to say, here's what peer review journal articles tell us. Uh, but I think there's most people anecdotally believe there's an extraordinary wave of behavioral health problems that are accompanying COVID-19. We know that every month since February, there's been an increase in overdose deaths in the United States. There was a brief study uh, embedded in the census in, I want to say in May, they just did a quick uh, snapshot in May, a couple, hundred, a couple thousand uh, people, census takers ask questions about anxiety and depression, uh, 30 plus 35 percent of people in that very small sample showed, showed signs of generalized anxiety disorder uh, and another 25 percent uh, had signs of major depression uh, in, in that brief say Now, surely some of that was was predated COVID-19, but again, what I've read and hear is that behavioral health providers are experiencing a wave of uh, business and uh, much of it related to uh, COVID-19. So here's the non-update. I've given you the update. Here's the non-update. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Social distance. Uh, the, 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 the ways in which we uh, prevent transmission of COVID-19. You know, uh, again, early on, how do you get it? And what if you're touching the vegetables in the grocery store? The, the, the good the good news in terms of an update is we know that contact uh, touching contact very lim very unlikely it's not to say it doesn't have a very unlikely this is a respiratory illness it's transported uh, between people in a respiratory way uh, usually sneezing coughing we also know churchgoers uh, singers musicians uh, a, a couple really troubling studies of church choirs found that there was one in, um, I want to say it's Washington State, 85% uh, of a, uh, a church choir contracted COVID after an asymptomatic uh, member uh, was uh, belting, belting it out, but unfortunately as part of belting out more respiratory droplets and uh, significant. So, so again, hand washing, 
uh, keeping six feet between people, uh, mask when you're out in public. Again, keeping six feet, all these things. Uh, uh, I, 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 I reach down here because that's where I keep my hand sanitizer in the car. I just, I'm so, so used to reaching for the hand sanitizer, even talking about it, I sort of automatically reach for the sanitizer. And then once someone's possibly been exposed, good public health practice is 14 days in, in isolation. Uh, that uh, uh, if, if someone's in a position where they may have been exposed, and we, uh, we see this in school settings where uh, uh, what, what will happen is when uh, individuals at school may have had possible exposure, they're expected to go home. I think that's protocol. Bill, help me out, make sure that's Alabama protocol. Uh, kid, kid shows up uh, uh, positive for COVID-19, um, uh, been exposed to these kids in these classes. Everybody goes home for 14 days. Is that the protocol in Alabama? I know you helped write that. It, yeah, it is. Uh, if there's been a contact with their within the uh, within that six feet uh, for an extended, you know, 15 minutes or more. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And I know some of you are doing partner tracing. I know a number of the social work staff in Alabama have gone home doing that. Um, we we had a case uh, uh, somewhere in North Georgia. Uh, where uh, school system, oh, the, the, high, the high school opened up, had a case, and because of lots of exposure and whatever, I think they sent 900 kids home on 14-day self-isolation. That's, again, that's good public health practice. It's, it's disruptive to the school year. It's disruptive to those families, uh, and we're going to keep wrestling with that. But uh, otherwise, if those people don't self-isolate and others are... Uh, exposed, we're, we're never going to get the transmission under control. So um, I want to stop and just remind everybody of our opportunities. Uh, you, you saw early on a phone number to call in questions. Um, there's an email address now to uh, send those to the ALPHT training network questions uh, and uh, also Facebook Live. We're monitoring all those. I, I miss having people in a classroom. I miss being able to have people raise their hand and either say, you know, this is great and I have another question or uh, this is stupid and I have a comment. Maybe if you think it's stupid, maybe uh, put a spin on it, but we welcome your feedback and certainly your questions. Bill, anything yet in the question box? No, but I did want to piggyback off of that. I, I, I know that we've got some uh, cases, case studies coming up in a, in a little bit. And so we certainly want some feedback and some, uh, uh, response from those that are watching today uh, to, to help us with these. So just put a plug in for being ready to send a question or an email. Be ready. Thank you. Yeah, part, part of what we're talking about today is the difficulty. Uh, I think ethical issues are always hard when, when uh, the department contacted me. It's a hard thing to do because there are some things that are clearly black and white. Again, as I reviewed uh, the, the state of ethics, you know, there's some clearly things that are that are malpractice, that are wrong, sexual relationships with customers, stealing from your employer. There's some, and then there are some gray area in terms of uh, what's what's best practice, what's you know in the client's best interest. You know, part of what we juggle as public health people is we're juggling. And I, this came up last week. We're juggling what's in our client's best interest. We're also, we have to juggle the public health good. One of the unique things about being public health professionals is we've got to think about our, our, our dual client relationships. That is, the, the person in front of us absolutely is our client, but anybody who does partner tracing for STIs or, or observe therapy uh, or, or people in children and family services that are, that are keeping kids safe, um, we do some things in public health that really speak to the public health good. Uh, we, one of the things I talked about last week was how uh, since the 1600s, that's the earliest I could go back, there had been laws about quarantine and sick people should stay home and people who are uh, infected on ships from other countries weren't allowed to, to land. So from the, from the earliest days before there even was a country, the idea that there was a, a desire need to protect the public health good has always been part of our conversation. And yet um, there is the person in the room. And, and the other layer of complexity here, in addition to the individual's need, the public health good, uh, the, the other reality is this, that there isn't a lot that's been written about 
uh, some of the issues that arise in terms of COVID-19. And so I think many of us are finding our way. I kept going back as I looked at looked at the things that I was wondering about, sort of what does our code of ethics, and, and again, for everybody, I think uh, PAs, nurses, uh, dietitians, everybody has your professional code of ethics to go back to. There are going to be places where uh, things are really clear, where uh, the, the decision to make is, is clear because it's clearly a violation of ethics, ethical principles to not act in that way. And there are probably going to be places where that conflict between your need, patient need, public health good, uh, create a gray area. And, and again, that is the reality of the pract practicing where we uh, where we practice. So, uh, just a quick review. Of these next four or five slides are a quick review. If you weren't here for uh, last week, I just want to touch on a couple of these macro issues. This whole issue of how do we contain disease and uh, individual freedom. So, so we are a country of give me liberty or give me death. I think from from again before we were a country, somebody said uh, Patrick Henry. Somebody said give me liberty or give me death. And so, so embedded in our cultural values is, is people's right to uh, do their own thing and, and right to worship and bear arms, right? And, and in the 21st century, in, in recent times, uh, I guess dating back probably to the Tea Party Revolution of late in the last century, just sort of uh, more concerned about, about how much tax and, and government overreach. There's a real... Uh, I think been a backlash that the government is too involved in taking land from people. And uh, there's a, a movement, particularly online, of people that think the government wants to uh, take firearms. And so all that culminates, that tension culminates in what we saw certainly early on, but, but by mid, late April, people started to rumble about the government can't tell me whether to wear a mask or not. Again, Bill's friend, People shaking their fists, take off your masks. Um, the 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 uh, reaction, these sort of over organized liberate with liberate North Carolina. Somewhere in, people went to Raleigh, liberate North Carolina, protested at the the state health, the state uh, capital to to say the government can't tell me if I why can't why can't I stay home? Why why can't I go out and live my life as I want? Why do I have to wear a mask? Why? Uh, am I being required to distance? So uh, again, obviously this mask wearing debate, it, it's its happening on the street. It's probably happening at your Walmart, even as we speak, or I guess Walmart's required everywhere, your food line or wherever you shop, wherever there aren't clear guidance. And sometimes even where there is clear guidance, there was a story yesterday, um, American Airlines pulled somebody off a plane because she refused to wear a mask because she punched the dude she punched the dude at the day at the gate. She was so mad about it. So, so these increasing uh, uh, openings of, of beaches and and what I talked about last week was how tired we are of of all this. You know, I, I just think I just want to name it's human nature. To say I'm tired of having to wear this mask and tired of having to stay home. I wish, you know, I, I wish I could go out for lunch with people. I, I wish I could. I think most of us. Uh, the, the, the true, true introverts are like, well, it's not really that big a deal. I'm home reading. It's a lot of peace and quiet. Uh, so there is a, there's a sliver of people for whom uh, uh, COVID-19 and the restrictions have not been so problematic for a lot of us. We are chomping at the bits or wanting to get out. So uh, again, I, I think what Bill talked about his friends who, who were, were screaming to take off a mask at strangers they didn't know. I think it was probably this political thing, like sort of, uh, are you uh, carrying a, a political agenda? You know, sort of, sort of. I perceive you because you wear a mask as being more politically liberal. Uh, again, what looks to me like a personal choice, what looks to me to be a pretty savvy public health thing, becomes a sort of political thing. And then. Uh, this confluence of skepticism about whether COVID is real and are do masks work and anti-government leaning, what about masks? So uh, opening schools, Bill, last two weeks ago, Bill was pulling his hair out. He'd been part of an Alabama public health group that had been coming up with guidance about schools. Uh, everybody left. Uh, uh, the 
you know, there's a movement to bring schools back. I mean, I think, uh, again, there's, there's clear consensus. The best education is in-person instruction. There's no doubt that kids are, are, are not getting all the uh, benefits of school if they're uh, plugged into Zoom or whatever else. And, and sort of uh, what about, you know, reopening the economy that if kids are back in school, businesses that support schools are gonna go, mom and daddy can go back full on to work, sort of there's an economic benefit and teachers are up in arms. Uh, the Georgia school I talked about did not require uh, kids to wear masks but teachers were masked, you know, that was a requirement for teachers. So, you know, as a teacher, you know, think about from a teacher's perspective, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60 years old, um, and you're exposed to 30 kids, different kids, first period, 27 kids, second period, uh, 28 kids, you know, uh, again, if you think about the level of risk in a, in a classroom setting. The other question that's yet to be determined is what's our tolerance gonna be for COVID-19 infection in schools? Uh, I just, I wonder as we start to see uh, third grade class with six kids get sick and another 24 go home, whatever. I, I just wonder in places where we've pushed for in-person instruction, what the threshold is. And I don't have the answer, um, thank heavens. I was not on the committee where I had to decide. That's why. That's why they pay and bill all them big bucks. And in, in addition to the prestigious title, Bill's making all that jack so that he can sit around and say, "Here's what we ought to do in terms of schools." I, I don't have an answer, but like I said, my belief is that we're going to reach a tipping point where the risk of COVID uh, is untenable. And and even even though kids tend to be uh, less symptomatic disease appears to be, I'm watching my words, disease appears to be less serious among people, young people. Those kids are coming back to their parents in their 30s, 40s, 50s. They're going to see Nana and Papa in their 70s, 80s, 90s. And, and so what we've got when we say, oh, it's no big deal, the, the kids are exposed. If there's a mistake, that has significant implications for the parents, for the grandparents, and for community spread. Again, I'm glad that it was not my decision to make about when and how to do that. So uh, the last thing I talked about kind of big picture is just this dramatic uh, shift to a uh, telework situation. 42% uh, uh, of the workforce as of June uh, went home. Two thirds of US economic activity um, uh, with 30 million people out of work, uh, just over 30 million people out of work. Uh, a third of the workforce is not working only 26% of the workforce is going into work. Healthcare workers, people that are, you know, uh, providing care, people that are pumping gas, people that are uh, certain retail that was deemed essential, more retail than I guess has gone back to work that I wouldn't call essential. But, um, you know, what the implications of this are, and, and again, from, our, from my perspective, uh, what this speaks to is the, the very rapid movement to remote work in public health, how many public health departments have sent all, some, most, decided who has to be in clinic, who doesn't have to be, all the ways in which we've decided what part of the public health workforce is, is gonna go home, stay home, uh, not be home. Um, so what I wanted to do is, is kind of move from this, I apologize that that was quick, but I, but I did want to, um, uh, to, to review that backdrop because today, as I said, I want to take it down to the micro level into the practice uh, setting and kind of think about how these things play out one-on-one -on -one and how ethical principles help us decide. So uh, we all believe in the land of the free. We all believe, ought to believe in individual freedom. Again, it's part of our fabric of our nation. Uh, and, and your client during his dialysis treatment, and he's, Many of you work dialysis, no dialysis workers, uh, works a local church. Uh, during dialysis, God has called him. God has called me to resume in-person church. That this business of being in the parking lot or either on Zoom or whatever they've been doing, uh, it isn't uh, what his creator, his divine source believes is the right thing to do. And... Uh, uh, 
that these mask wearing social distancing going to detract and uh, what your client says is I believe uh, re precautions shouldn't be required as this is freedom of religion. This is a freedom of religion issue uh, because they're impacting his congregation's spiritual experience. And this is about freedom uh, of religious expression that the government doesn't have any any business. And there you are, a public health worker, with your own opinion. And I hope starting to think what is what is the ethical dilemma. Uh, again, as I went back to uh, social work ethics, what I what I thought about is is as social workers, we believe strongly in the the role of human relationships, the the importance of human relationships in terms of sustaining our lives, improving the quality of lives and the, the reason we're here, as it were. And so as I thought about, you know, sort of what, what do we, what's our response to the minister who says, this is about freedom of religion. I miss my people. I'm not connecting with my people. My people are not connecting with one another, that these public health constraints are impacting uh, the uh, ability uh, of not only spiritual expression, but of these human relationships and uh, uh, invites us by, by way of bringing it up, I think invites us to mull over what we want to do. Um, so what's the answer? Uh, on the one hand, I got two options for you and the phone lines are open, the Facebook is open. On the one hand, um, this goes back to a client's right to self-determination uh, for social workers, in particular, the first day of school, unless you uh, skip school that day or unless you weren't paying attention. Um, we heard that at the heart of our ethical beliefs is people's right to, to self-determination, to, to live their own life and, and find their way. And so what, what that implies is our goal becomes, I'm gonna support this client in his spiritual direction. I'm gonna say, great. Pastor, I think it's great that uh, this is the, the way you've been called, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm going to support that choice. I think that's a great choice, Pastor. Or another thought is uh, our duty to protect uh, this individual and the people in his congregation. And, and sort of as I'm sitting there thinking about what do I say to this dude there, in, in my dialysis room, uh, I say, well, uh, pastor, this could hurt you. You're going to be exposed to 30, 40, 100, 200 people's breath and res respiratory secretions and droplets. Um, and, and then the people in your congregation are also potentially exposed. And so I'm going to emphasize concern and share those concerns. Uh, and I'm going to discourage him and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to face the, the, the risky face, and I would encourage him, encourage him not to act on your instincts. Pastor, that's a bad idea, and here are all the reasons why uh, that's a bad idea. Hmm. Which of those? You want to vote, Bill? Certainly. Uh, you know, I like a good debate. Um, I know you do. Come on. Well, you, I would even go, I'd go, uh, I would go number, number two, uh, emphasize the potential harm, certainly, to the clients. And I think I would talk to him a little bit about informed consent, you know, as he's talking to his uh, clients, his, uh, his congregation, is he advising them of the, uh, the dangers of congregating and in letting them make that decision um, in it with an educated, you know, d decision making there. Uh, yeah. I, and I've heard, I've heard, uh, congregations here in Montgomery, uh, some are opening back up and, uh, and they're putting a lot of things in place. They're making sure they've, they've changed their, uh, uh, uh Sunday morning worship service to, uh, cut down on the number of interactions, uh, you know, instead of, passing the offering plate or, or some of the other things that we're, there's contact, they're, they're spacing folks out. And, and then they're also making sure to advise the congregation 
that they uh, that there is some danger that, that trying to mitigate it, but uh, it's not going to necessarily completely uh, wipe out the possibility. Uh, but reminding them, hey, use social distancing, wash your hands, wear your mask, all of those things, and so we can meet. Uh, yeah, that would yeah. be my my thoughts. Excellent argument, Bill. I'm not I'm not going to answer this one, but. The other, the other thing to, to weigh, I love the idea of, of uh, recognizing people's right to inform consent and, and making sure parishioners are aware. The other thing to factor in is the influence, depending on the circumstance, the influence the pastor has among his churchgoers. And, and so in some ways, you can argue that, that it's especially important that he be mindful because... Uh, in the role of pastor, many places people do what the pastor says and the power of the role of pastor. And so when he says, come on, y'all, let's open up, particularly if he doesn't uh, uh, invite informed consent and talk about the downside of that, uh, I worry that, uh, yeah, the worry that that um, there could be undue influence. And, and Jim, I have actually had several conversations with a variety of, of different uh, um, pastors, uh, and uh, we talked about uh, back to to the slide right before that, talking about the importance of human relationships, talking about uh, recognizing the, that importance of, of uh, human relationship and how that uh, is important in a church. Oftentimes. You've got older, uh, an older population uh, that maybe is a little isolated, and in churches, that big key opportunity for them to have uh, some social contact. And yeah. so, how can you yeah. do that safely? You know, yeah. what other options are available? And yeah. I know a lot of churches have continued, even if they've gone live, continued to do that. Uh, you know, YouTube, uh, whatever the means, Facebook Live kind of yeah. service yeah. as well, so that that they still have that contact with their congregation and, and try to include them in whatever they're doing. And so I think that's probably one of the things that we've seen is uh, uh, churches that have gone uh, to trying to offer their, their services in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. As Virtual, we, we've got some churches here in Asheville, Bill, where uh, they're doing it on the parking lot. Uh, you know, people are social distancing. The preacher, I guess, is there with some kind of sound system out in the parking lot, people are spread apart. I, I, I drove past a, a couple of weeks ago, I drove past a pretty small congregation. They were all masked, all in chairs six feet apart, and the preacher was doing a kind of late morning service. Well, let me give you an easy one, Bill. That, that was tough. I apologize. Here's an easy one for you. This is about mask wearing. And, and again, one of the big picture issues that plays out right there in the in this case, it would be a case management or me, uh, mental health providers setting your client uh, mr barnes uh, stated in the past that he believes mask wearing is a political plot and says in america they can't make me uh wear a mask uh, he gets uh injections uh, long-acting injectable uh medication to manage his schizoaffective disorder out every four weeks so Mr. Barnes, in order to not have the very serious complications of unmanaged schizoaffective disorder, uh, takes advantage of your mental health centers or psychiatrists or probably not primary care. I don't think most primary care is going to do long-acting injectable. Somebody psychiatric is, is ordering and uh, behavioral health administration of uh, his uh, long-acting medication. And he's going to come back in four weeks, and here we go. So again, as I sort of mold over, what do we do with with someone who believes, uh, you know, their their political concerns conflict? Uh, part of what I struggled with as I thought about this is that the the belief uh, in our our dignity of the individual, the worth of each person, the ethical principle from the NASW code talks about we will respect the dignity and worth of the person. And, and so sort of uh, my belief that, that, gosh, if that's the case, that as we prepare to think about how we respond to Mr. Barnes, we, we'd better bear in mind that this is an individual who ought to be 
uh, allowed his expression that our res the position of respect is to allow him to act on his beliefs and we should accommodate them. Here's your answer. Uh, the clinic should accommodate Mr. Barnes' perception of his needs and support his dignity by administering his injection as planned, regardless of whether or not he's using a mask, whether or not he consents to mask use, that it is our job as ethical providers to, to provide the necessary services that he needs regardless of his use of masks. Or the other possibility is Mr. Barnes should be informed of the danger to himself and others by his refusal to wear a mask. Uh, he'll be advised that all consumers are expected to wear a face covering at every visit, or here's the tricky part, services will not be delivered. And for anybody who's worked with someone who needs long acting injectable uh, antipsychotic medication to function, uh, what the implications of our denying service has have implications for Mr. Barnes, but also for uh, for the the community in which he lives. Uh, Bill, where are you going to go with this one? What do you think? Well, fortunately, here in Alabama, uh, the governor has required masks and done. Uh, and so, yeah, we're we're okay there. Okay, um, I don't Woo. know, uh, you, you know, but we're still hearing it. I mean, we're hearing it all over the state of, of isolated or or uh, specific situations where uh, folks are refusing to wear masks and uh, and they're being, you know, advised. I'm sorry, you can't come in. Uh, right. You know, you'll you'll need to find uh, another place to do uh, to provide uh, to receive your services. And so, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's uh, you know, a restaurant, whatever the case may be, uh, folks are being uh, being turned away here in Alabama. Now, in this case, we with us. Let's shout out to Governor Ivey for helping yeah. us out of this one. Yep, yep. So, and depending on but, where but people are you, outside you, of Alabama, you go right across the state line into Georgia, though, and it's not a requirement. And uh, even though you may know it's, it's best practice, um, you know, what do you do? And, yeah. So. And, and, and again, Bill, uh, we're not Walmart, and this guy not getting his long-acting antipsychotic is going to have enormous implications for him, for his family, for the place that he lives. All right, here's an easy one. Here's an easy one. Uh, your client is Ms. Jones. She's there in the WIC clinic. I know I got some WIC dietitians. I hope I got some WIC dietitians. So dietitians, step up here. Give us the answer. Uh, if you have one in the chat box, uh, send an email. Uh, two children, she's an administrative assistant. Uh, she's been teleworking since March, but the boss says that the, we're going to we're gonna open up the office Labor Day, and it's essential to be there as, quote, she's his right-hand man, unquote. During her WIC appointment, she breaks down. I know my dietitians love it when they break down in your WIC appointment, and she, or she just found out that school's going to be hybrid, that is a little in person, a little live, alternate weeks. Here, my kids are going to be home this week uh, watching Zoom class. Here, they're going to go back and back and forth, uh, and two children going to be at home. So what's the right thing to do? Um, I, I, I read about this, and I thought, well, uh, what's the social justice issue? Sort of, it doesn't seem right that a mother should have to choose between her employment and uh, uh, and and her kids' needs. And doggone it, social workers are ready to take to the streets and say this is uh, unjust to make a woman choose between employment and and the needs of her kids. And we're going to advocate. So, so I got the answer. You should advocate for Ms. Jones and actively help her seek legal representation. You're uh, going to call the, the health department lawyer, say, can you get her a deal? You feel her civil liberties are being compromised and the appropriate stance for her and you as her advocate is to fight that employer's unjust decision mandating her to go back to work. Or that employer has a right to set expectations. It's his, it's his 
shop, it's his car dealer, it's his whatever else, uh, including where they work. Uh, if it's my business, I can decide who works for me and where they work. It's reasonable to expect, hey, she was hired to work at the workplace, uh, to report where they're expected to work, or we're sorry, Ms. Jones, find other employment. The answer is, Bill, I hate to tell you, the answer is a lot more like number two than one on this one. And that is not my personal wish. It's the limits of her legal protection. What we know with the CARES Act funding is uh, employers with fewer than 500 people get 10 weeks at home to take care of their kids. And so we could say, well, Ms. Jones, the law is going to allow, CARE Act law going to allow you late March, will allow you 10 weeks. That might solve a problem for 10 weeks. Uh, uh, to go home and, and and take care of kids. I'm not sure that her employer couldn't come back and say, you've been home for 10 weeks, you need to think of something else. Uh, unfortunately, because of employment law, um, there are not a lot of, if if her employer sets a hard line, uh, there there isn't much recourse. That if she says, I gotta stay home every other week and her employer says that won't work for me, um, there aren't legal legal safeguards for her. Her employer does have the right to terminate. Bill, you got a compromise for us? I, I wish I did, Jim. I, I do know <laughs> that this is something that we're hearing a lot here, even yeah. at public health. And uh, certainly uh, teachers have gone back to work. Uh, and so there's, there's uh, different things going on there. There's students that have gone back uh, and trying to find a, a happy medium so that we can get the job done, but also uh, keep people safe and, and, and try to take care uh, of other issues. So, yeah, I think yeah. the only the only compromise I see is coaching her on the best way to approach her employer. But but with the caveat that that legally there's no there's no threat to I, I don't I don't think it makes sense. And I'm not sure lawyering up for her makes sense, given the reality. I think a uh, bottom line is, uh, uh, you know, that's. The, the choice she has may come down to uh, go to work the way the boss man wants or not. However, the interim is to say, let's work on how you could talk to your employer. Let's talk about how you can invite compromise. Uh, so the last one I've got, uh, uh, again, is sort of about this freedom to open up uh, whatever else. Um, so uh, you're, you, you've been out uh, uh, working, telework, and you're back in the office, a number of coworkers, bunch of them, uh, younger than you. You're uh, on Facebook with some of the kids you work with, and four of your coworkers were down in Gulf Shores for a long weekend. It appeared they were not using social distancing or safety protocols as they recounted the trip on social media. Now, Bill, we may have a few people that aren't from Alabama, so we won't have to explain. Gulf Shores is a lovely resort town at the beach. Um, where, Bill, I don't want to offend anybody, a few adult beverages have been consumed down in Gulf Shores. Would that be safe to say? There's a real good chance a bushwhacker's <laughs> been drunk in, in Gulf Shores at some point. <laughs> Not anybody Bill knows, but there have been times when people have been overserved down in Gulf Shores and had a little too much fun. Isn't that correct? This is correct. And, uh, you know, actually, we do have a couple of coworkers that, that have a, a place or their family have has a place in Gulf Shores. And so they've been giving me reports as they've come back. Uh, as they call it, it's, uh, there are places that they would consider Petri dishes uh, in, in, uh, in Gulf Shores. Not all places, certainly not all places. And uh, a lot of good things are being done. A lot of social distancing is being done. Restaurants down there are trying to, to work with uh what they can and uh but then then there are other options uh, other places where folks are just not paying attention and not not uh social distancing so I, I would guess a place in may when we opened up some bars said let's go for it and let's really let down our hair i would guess yeah and, and i think you know you see uh maybe out on boats where they're they're getting gathering together and, and buy your boats up and yeah that kind of thing all right so you know, I went back to the Code of Ethics, and it talks about how we're supposed to treat our colleagues. 
So I, I, I don't know that this uh, relates to nursing code of ethics and dietitian code of ethics, but we, we've been, uh, to, we are told as social workers and ASW code of ethics, treating our colleagues with respect and represent accurately and fairly views obligation. Uh, we should avoid unwarranted negative criticism of colleagues uh, in communication or with other professionals. What our code of ethics tells us. You've seen people honky tonking on Facebook. They're now back in the office, no masks, sitting in the lunchroom with you. So, uh, What's our answer? I, 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 on the one hand, I think, gosh, we need to respect our colleagues. And it means let them have a break from work, uh, have a little fun without judgment. They're probably taking precautions, you say to yourself. And by the way, you are not the office police telling people who can and can't go. I had a friend come to town last week and we did a social distance thing, but we put our heads together for a picture uh, at the end. It's a high school girlfriend, and we put our heads together for a picture, and uh, somebody called us out. I hope your face masks were in your pocket, right? So we did. I, I did have the Facebook police call me out last week. Um, or given the increased risk that you think occ occurred, you saw these girls on Facebook, uh, you have a duty to yourself and others in the office to let management know what you're aware of and ask that precautions be taken to protect the rest of the office, at least send them home for 14 days to self-isolate because of what you saw. Bill, you gonna be the office police or you gonna look the other way? Well, I actually have somebody that sent in a comment. They said, uh, what about when they tape up an employee's workstation so no one goes in there uh, however, they won't disclose why they're not there, you know, so protecting <laughs> wow. the, the employee's right to privacy, but also, um, uh, you know, trying to protect those that are around you. Right, right. Well, I'm, that you requires a lot of, I'm going to trust that, that the people that are taping up a cube uh, are smart public health people who are concerned about the employee's privacy, and I'm going to say, well, surely... If any of us have been exposed before the tape went up, these really smart employers would uh, do the right thing. I mean, heck, they've got us doing contact tracing if there'd been a problem in our office. Uh, but it does require a leap of faith. And I think uh, as an employee, what I'm hearing is if there's any possible exposure to those of us working beside these girls, that you, I guess I didn't even say they were girls, it could have been boys, these boys, whoever was down in Gulf Shores. Uh, those of us who could be exposed, uh, if you know of an exposure, then we are trusting you as our employer to uh, let us know. And, and the employer does have a responsibility to protect others in the workplace. I'm gonna give them a break and say if, the, if they've only taped up a cube and there uh, isn't, uh, con contact tracing and notification in the office, then that m I'm going to trust the employer, particularly a public health employer, is doing the right thing. And uh, I think the person who had an illness does have a right to privacy. So I, um, that's where I'm going to line up. In this case, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I probably am, am not going to say anything, but I'm going to keep a real, real wide berth for 14 days and stay away from everybody for four. I'm, I'm going to stay out of the lunchroom for 14 days and do whatever. Bill, you're going to you gonna engage the boss or you're going to let it go? You know, I think I'm going to uh, probably let somebody know. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm trying to continue to come to work, so <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be sick. Um, I know, I know. Anyway, all right, Bill. And I, Bill, and I, Bill, I, Bill I'm be guilty. The police. I, I'm also guilty of uh, on occasions not wearing my mask, and so I've had folks remind me, and I, I, I usually, I, I appreciate that. I just, you get busy and you run to the restroom, run or off to a meeting or something. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. So, yeah. 
All right. Bill, Bill going to Bill going to notify him. I'm just going to eat lunch out in the parking lot for two weeks till the scare clears. That's right. That's where I end up. So please, y'all, if you got answers, what are we going to do with the pastor or Mr. Jones or the poor sobbing teacher there in your wit clinic or uh, these kids that went to Gulf Shores? If you got answers or comment, please feel free. I, Jim, we actually have had a few comments on our Please. Facebook, uh, and one of them uh, they sent over to me said it was pretty good. Uh, I think it had to do with the first one, uh, the gentleman who, uh, the dialysis patient. Yeah, the and, pastor. The, right, the pastor. And and then uh, they said uh, some people may not fully be aware of the dangers uh, due to cognition. And then also, what about age? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. children uh, not able to make a, a – maybe an educated decision. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. So and, you, and you talked about informed consent, Bill. At some point, we got to say it's a different risk to your parishioners who are 30 than 70. And pastor, who's coming to church? And yeah, full disclosure, does he understand what can happen? And does he understand, uh, I guess, that you use that phrase, uh, informed consent, I think you'd have to say to the parishioners, look, if y'all over 60, we're especially concerned because that's what we've been told is especially risk group. And, and again, I, some of the churches that I've had contact with, they are very open. Uh, you know, please uh, stay home if you, if you check any of the boxes, as they say. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we, documented in, in, in the newspapers here. We had a church up in North Alabama a few weeks ago that uh, decided to have a um, revival, a week-long oh, revival. Yeah. And, uh, and we had, uh, I think, about 40 people that were positive out of that. And so, uh, again, uh, we all are responsible for our own behavior and, and our own decisions, but making sure that they're uh, informed and, and uh, educated decisions. And and protecting those that aren't able to make those decisions. Exactly. I think exactly. was the, the comment that was made here. What about those that aren't yeah. able to make decisions? And uh, certainly in uh, some of our settings, uh, whether they're in group homes or nursing homes or places like that, they're there uh, expecting somebody to make decisions, good decisions that are going to protect them. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. Yeah. That's where I'm going next, Bill. Actually, I, I, I want to talk about informed consent. And, and, and again, what's happened is we've gone so quickly to uh, uh, digital uh, uh, provision of service. Uh, this is a, from an old talk I did on, on mental health care for behavioral health. But, but what, and then this is pre-COVID, but just how many uh, people with mental health problems don't have access, uh, aren't receiving care, uh, substance use disorder. 75 counties in the United States, there's no mental health. So, so the context for this was, uh, again, it was a behavioral health audience, but just the enormous unmet need. I think if you talk about most of the rural Southeast, uh, you could talk about mental health care. You could talk about uh, certain sub medical subspecialties. You know, people can get pri primary care, family medicine, usually pediatric. But if you need any kind of specialty care in, in the rural Southeast, you got to drive an hour or two. Alabama, I know, you're going to drive to Birmingham and have to pay that parking fee. You're going to have to drive to Huntsville. You're going to have to drive to Montgomery. You have to go all the way down to Mobile and, and get that need met. Or we're going to fire up uh, a, a telemedicine option for you. So. So the exists uh, the massive need existed before COVID-19, even when it was safe for people to drive into our clinic, whatever else. So uh, people have been doing phone and video, uh, web-based uh, uh, therapeutic tools, computer tools. We've been uh, chatting and emailing. Uh, patient forums exist. Uh, uh, social networking exists. Again, uh, some of this HIPAA compliance, some of it. Uh, peer coaches, other uh, non-medical, uh, and an enormous growth in terms of use of uh, phone technology. Uh, I'm, my spouse does uh, has done work, a significant amount of work overseas, and, and everybody in the developing world, uh, 
the inexpensive smartphones. So there, there are lots and lots of ways to reach people in rural Africa, rural Asia, uh, people with this. And so there are medication reminders on your phone. Clinic appointment reminders, enormous explosion in the last 10 years of health based phone apps that in, in this country as well, certainly uh, teen pregnancy, medication adherence, all kinds of different things, but, but also overseas where if you got your phone, we can remind you to go to your point. We can remind you to take your blood sugar. We can uh, ask you to monitor uh, your blood glucose level, all kinds of ways that the phone becomes a therapeutic tool. Um, and then COVID-19 comes. And so what we see is early in March, the Center for Medicaid Services uh, says, hold on, uh, no restrictions on telehealth. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, CHIP services, so child health services, can be billed at office rates. So there was this vast, enormous push. Uh, and uh, they say, we don't care about copay. That shouldn't be an issue. So so med your Medicaid uh, WIC visit will be reimbursed at the in-office rate. Don't worry if your patient can't just keep them WIC patients being seen. Uh, you only need consent once a year, again, to try to minimize the burden as you know, as this rocket ship took off and this enormous need, we're all figuring out kind of how to do it. The government, the federal government tried to move away as many restrictions. And so all kinds of folks, dietary, PT, OT, uh, we've all expanded virtual check-in, e-visits, telephone uh, during the crisis. Uh, other changes uh, used to be, but if you were in Alabama and wanted to practice in Georgia, there was a, a red line. There was no way to do that. And virtually every state restricted most disciplines from practicing outside of, of where they were licensed. Those restrictions were lifted uh, for now. And these are all in place for now, I, you know, because I don't have a crystal ball when COVID ends or when it changes. I'm assuming for the foreseeable future, uh, even though I'm based in North Carolina and uh, I know there's a need for clinical social work service in Alabama, I'm on contract with Bill and we're going to go ahead and get on that. For now, uh, those existing geographic restrictions have been lifted most parts of the country. Uh, uh, we used to say back to telemedicine uh, pre-March 1, your tools need to be HIPAA compliant, like what you use needs to be HIPAA compliant. And then what what moved as we had to move so quickly is the government said, oh, try for HIPAA compliance, but uh, that requirement is waived. And the, the, the um, uh, legislation specifically said, don't use Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, or other you know, kind of public uh, tools. Uh, what, what Bill and I talked about this before, the thing, uh, Alabama Department of Health said, you're going to use our software and our hardware only. And I think a number of places tried to really quickly get on board with HIPAA compliant tools. Most people have tried to, to pick up HIPAA compliant tools. But, but again, you talk about two thirds of the workforce who went remote. A lot of folks just picked up an unsecured cell phone and said, hey, we're home. Don't go to the clinic. How you doing? What do you need? Here's how you get your medicine and whatever else. And so uh, I think there's been a migration to HIPAA compliant tools. Um, but but again, because of the, the unprecedented pressure to get services continued while we were all figuring it out, uh, a lot of people started off HIPAA. Bill, you want to weigh in? I do. Uh, we, I had a comment earlier uh, talking about this very thing and uh, Certainly, just because um, maybe HIPAA compliance has been waived, at what what point do you still have a uh, responsibility to protect that patient's information uh, ethically? Whether you know, and I see you know you, you mentioned Facebook Live and TikTok and Twitch and some of these others uh, making you know they did it, at least put those in there, but put some limits in there, but. Uh, how do I know that I haven't uh, violated the privacy of my patient, you know, based off of 
using some other equipment or something. Yeah, I, I think that's why people race to find what what I mean, most people, realistically, I think three quarters of people, Bill, just started Googling what is HIPAA compliant the third week of March when, when all, all heck came crashing down. So most people were, were not prepared. I, I think it is absolutely the ethical choice to make because of, you know, for all of us, patient privacy, whatever your discipline, patient right to privacy is at the top of our ethical mandate. And so I think most everybody is, is morphing towards those more HIPAA compliant. I think the, the other reality is, um, again, I, I know people that, that, that couldn't get stuff out of their desk, things closed so fast, you know? And so, so I left my purse and half a sandwich back in the office uh, March 20th and haven't been back. Uh, and, and, and so again, uh, for a lot of people, it was just, I'm gonna send her a text, not secure text, but just girl, we ain't in the office, don't go or call them. Do you need to stay on that prescription we gave you? And here are the, is the guidance for refill. So, so in an improv, I knew, I heard of people doing FaceTime, which is not HIPAA compliant and any, but just whatever tool you got, whatever tool you have that is also compatible with your patient. I think the other struggle bill, and you know this as well as anybody is we can't assume that everybody we needed to reach was on high speed internet and able to download uh, a HIPAA compliance software tool for us. And so part of this was, uh, what can we get up to speed quickly to communicate with consumers that, you know, and, and what, what can we expect uh, end users, our clients to have? My sister is a, a social worker in Western North Carolina. Her, her deal goes, her area goes way, way out to Western North Carolina and her peers in Raleigh say, oh yeah, we just have gone on to Zoom and whatever else. And my sister said, is I got so many people down in a holler or here or there where they can't get there ain't there ain't there ain't I'm down talking like I'm from from where there isn't high speed internet or or any internet that that you know she's going I, I don't have the same options as my my colleagues in Raleigh or or Charlotte have she's talking about a whole different geography just because what's not accessible to her consumers out there in the far west side. You know, uh, one of the things that came to mind, I think it goes back to informed consent and, and letting your clients know uh, maybe there there might be some uh, shortcomings with whatever that. you're using. And so yeah. just being up front with them to say, hey, we're going to do the best we can. Is that OK with you? And if they're agreeable, um, kind of going yeah. from there. The other thing that came to mind, too, also was uh, and some of the concerns we've had here with public health is we've gone to making phone calls and and, and uh, talking with patients uh you start picking up maybe a little bit on maybe there's been some abuse neglect or uh some domestic violence or something like that going on and you're wondering okay who else is in the room who yeah. else is listening uh is the perp uh perpetrator in the room you bet. Uh, and yeah. so that, that's been a huge concern for us here, something we've talked about, had a couple of meetings on and don't necessarily have a good answer yet, but just trying to, to figure that out. And, uh, you know, even we've had, you know, to go to meetings uh, that we do uh, virtually. And uh, afterwards, I was on the phone uh, talking to, to one of the folks in the meeting and I said, y'all were kind of quiet today. And uh, the response was, I don't know who else is in the room. I don't know who I was listening in. Right. And right. so uh, right. they're a little hesitant. And so yeah. that communication uh, has been hampered a little bit by not knowing who else might be off screen. So Well, and, and Bill, some, some consumers don't know to not open up their smartphone there at McDonald's and talk to their psychiatric case manager, right? So I'm at McDonald's talking about, well, yeah, I took my uh, Lamictral, but I don't know that it's working and whatever else. And they're What's your dilemma? You're there talking to the whole group at McDonald's. The other reminder, Bill, whether perpetrator's in the room or not, he's going to go back and check her phone. And, and so for all of us to be mindful, I've, I've done enough work in, in intimate partner violence to know that it's the threat of who's there right now and, uh, and, and, and does he follow up. And most likely you should assume a text message 
phone calls. He's going to follow up. So, Bill, you've mentioned informed consent. I got a lot of detail here. I'm just going to kind of gloss over. Uh, I wanted people to have this information, but it really is uh, uh, better used as a resource later. I, I'd say when you go into staff meeting, when you talk to your IT people, say, hey, I was on this webinar with ADPH, good looking bald guy, please say it that way, good looking bald guy said, we got some questions of informed consent to weigh in here. And so so just the next five or six slides, just invite you to think about, and again, I'm not sure everybody on this call answers, but as you interact with your supervisor, with your work team, with the people that, that do IT for you, asking yourself kind of, uh, how we establish informed consent about process and options. Uh, again, is the consumer uh, talking in real time with us, that's synchronous, or is it a kind of uh, a, a listserv where I'm sending a message, they're sending? Uh, what are our standards for responding? How often? Uh, what do we do about misunderstandings? And here's a tough one. Best practice says here are the options for you. I think best practice says here are the options for you in terms of service delivery. The consequence there is what if this what if the clinic isn't open? What if our agency isn't open to in person? And I, I think as this thing continues, as people kind of wrestle with who's coming in to receive direct service or not, this question ethically, what do we do if the client is saying, I don't want to be on Zoom. I want to see my darn dietitian. I want her to uh, advise me in real time. I want her to look at my kid before she tells me what the dietary problem is, and I want to come in and see you. Uh, other aspects of informed consent, obviously, who's going to have access to the clinical information uh, on the provider side. On the, the technical side, you know, once you add sort of electronic communication. What does your IT staff have access to? What do they do with that information? If you're doing a group level intervention or, you know, I'm thinking our, our friends at Wise Woman, uh, shout out to Wise Woman, people that sponsor uh, these uh, meetings. Uh, if they're doing uh, the, the fine group work that they do, you know, who's on that computer then? Uh, and, and again, sort of questions about who else might be viewing. Uh, I think as informed consent, the benefits and, and challenges of the technology is, is part of it. I think uh, making services more accessible has to be there. And for many of us, certainly early in the pandemic, uh, stay home order, it was the only way to access service. And so, uh, you know, I think still for places that are uh, not allowing customers or limiting how many consumers this is a way to keep service continuity for now. And we're working towards privacy and uh, maybe have time to reflect in between uh, visits, maybe especially with asynchronous communication. If we're emailing back and forth or you send me your homework and then I send that back to you. The other advantage that I talked about, uh, the, the, the deserts for certain subspecialists, the idea that certain uh, you may have access to a certain specialist you wouldn't have. So obviously at the heart of all of what we do, both ethically and legally, and here's where ethics crosses into legal uh, confidentiality for uh, certainly for social work. And I think all uh, professions, I think all health healthcare professions, certainly all public health, confidentiality, confidentiality gets into the issue of federal law. And any time... I'm talking about ethics and I do or don't have this opinion. At some level, you gotta step back and say, hold on, what, what does the law say about that? Bill called me out with my mask wearing client and say, no, there isn't an ethical dilemma because law always trumps ethics. The law in the state of Alabama said, in this case, it's federal law, confidentiality law uh, trumps, trumps all ethical concerns. And so uh, confidentiality, uh, uh, applies to all use of technology. Um, it, it, they're exactly the same in person. Again, for those of you that had never used telehealth and, and until the pandemic, there's no difference in terms of what's protected patient information, uh, what's not protected information. And then uh, those gray areas where we're required to violate uh, confidentiality for, for most of us, 
we're uh, we have duty to warn child abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, elder abuse, medical emergencies, threats of violence to self or others. Um, all, all of those have uh, state and federal law that require us to breach confidentiality. I want to make sure that's documented in the record. I'm not going to do that without my supervisor's knowledge and consent. Uh, I, I encourage everybody. I mean, again, you are a mandated reporter, but don't go down that road alone. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't think anybody who's about to violate federal law should go down that road alone. I, w I want that uh, child's parents notified if there's abuse. I want the family of an elder who we think is being abused. But I don't think that's the kind of thing because the consequences of violating confidentiality law. I don't think that's a road anybody should go down without your supervisor, without documenting your supervisor's consent, and probably without them checking with senior leadership and or a legal opinion, depending on if there's any gray area left. So um, in addition to sort of the, the nuts and bolts of privacy, the risks involved in privacy, how encrypted is the software, um, uh, how uh, uh, can uh, transmission between tools, again, the the, the, the goal of all the HIPAA approved software, HIPAA compliance software, is it's encrypted. The safeguards uh, during transmission are such uh, uh, that um, they don't pose a risk of, of breaches. And so uh, uh, based on the, uh, the technology that you're using, you may be able to say, we're sure that this tool is encrypted. We're sure that the software allows uh, uh, transmission of these text messages between us in a way that can't compromise your confidentiality. Um, uh, and, and again, what you as an organization do, as a public health entity do to um, uh, control, manage uh, privacy, uh, limiting who's, who's involved, the use of passwords. Again, this is what your IT people should be doing all the time. Uh, real limits on, on email. All of our personal email is not secure enough to be doing client uh, interface. That, that's absolutely clear. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google, uh, I want to shop it at a, a Crate and Barrel, and you'll see your email somehow automatically knows you're at Crate and Barrel, even though you never talked about it, whatever. And, and, and so none of our, the major email programs are not safe. I mean, again, that's why I think ADPH said only our software, only our hardware because of the limitations. Again, what security risks without a VPN? V VPN. Bill, do you know what a VPN stands for? I'm blanking. VPN. Anyway, VPN is a network that's been created with a level of security that's different than your home security. Um, and, and so in the absence of a VPN to think through what's your internet security and then virusware, spyware, all the things that people do in order to do that. Bill, let me catch my breath, do a time check, any questions? Uh, no, no additional questions at this time. Jay. Okay, no worries. So just closing with some final thoughts about best practice. And this is, this is a pre COVID-19, these are just uh, sort of good practice, sort of uh, making sure that the systems you're using are secure, uh, uh, making sure that bandwidth on both ends, again, as you're negotiating with the client, hey, we've gone to telehealth, we want you to go to telehealth, what's their bandwidth? You know, I've, I've been interacting with friends uh, who I'm, I'm sure have you know, solid internet packages at home, and they're already freezing up and doing some of that. And so if you talk about people, again, depending on the strength of signal, you know, will your client, uh, uh, will your client's ability even allow you to uh, transmit a, a, a video? Uh, again, mostly it's not a problem to do audio, but, but the use of video uh, in, in, a, in a Skype or a Zoom really requires a, a good deal of bandwidth. And then what about encryption? Has the uh, encryption uh, uh, appropriate to, to maintain security? Test your equipment again as you're getting used to use new equipment or practicing new software. Uh, I live with someone who is the, the absolute least tech savvy person 
uh, ever in the world and uh, doesn't, uh, gets a new invite to a class or to a business thing and doesn't download the software. And so it's always this chaos. So I couldn't get in um, because uh, the, 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 the software needed to be downloaded. It wasn't compatible. And so all those glitches for you and for your consumers, again, making sure your consumers download the software, test the system before the meeting time. And again, uh, some ideas about the role of your consumer satisfaction at the heart of any ethical decision of all of our practice is thinking what's best for the client. The, the client relationship, regardless of profession, is the most important factor. So as you move to telehealth or expand telehealth, sort of what's the what's the relationship, what's the impact on the relationship and, and is there any impact on the treatment relationship? Um, to be clear about what technology can and can't do, one of the things I, I haven't said that strikes me, there are some studies where particularly when people do uh, uh, assessment, medical assessment, substance use assessment, sexual health, I, I do a lot of teen pregnancy and family planning. There, there are studies that suggest when I can anonymously sign in and tell you about my risk. I'm more honest than when I have to face uh, face you face to face. I, I don't know, but I would imagine it's easier to tell a piece of software uh, that you had chocolate cake, even you promised your dietitian you wouldn't have any more chocolate cake than it would be to say to my dietitian in real time, you know, I had more chocolate cake, even though I swore to you I would not eat any chocolate cake. Mm. It's getting to be on lunchtime. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to get me a chocolate cake. Uh, uh, ask the client suggestions about how the tools can be used and improved. Talked about test runs earlier. Listen to your client feedback. Again, you may not be able to change it. In other words, the software, software may be all that the company offers you. It may be all that's compliant. And I think moving to digital services uh, uh, does change the human interaction. I said earlier, I am an old school trainer and I just miss being in a classroom. I miss all of us gathering at the donuts there in the back right before we start or there at the at the break and having a donut and whatever else. And so it, it, it technology changes our interaction. And, and I think just to name that and invite your colleague to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, invite your clients to talk about that. Uh, Talking about what data will be gathered, obviously some of our uh, clients are already nervous there in the office about who's going to see that record. But once I'm transmitting over the web in a digital way, uh, who gets that information, who sees these, um, who sees it, who has access to my record. And then again, remembering the goal is the client being able to manage their you know, self-management as the goal. Um, uh, good guidance from SAMHSA that I, that I took from a previous workshop and I wanted to share. Uh, your clinical judgment, not just this technology, should uh, guide our decision making. Again, I think to bear in mind that ethical practice means, well, I always use Zoom. Zoom is, is what's here. That's what I'm, I'm going to do. But rather, what's, your, what's the best choice in your, for this patient in your clinical judgment? Um, using technology within the scope of your practice, always making sure that you're uh, remembering when uh, when things cross that line that's outside your scope of practice. Nurses, there's a line where it goes to nurse practitioner, probably dietitians, there's a place where it crosses the line and, and, and goes to nurses or physician, other practitioners. Um, uh, and everybody thoughtful fully considering the risk and benefit. What we've talked about all day today is uh, uh, the risk and benefit. So, so uh, just I could, we could have done two hours just on HIPAA. I won't torture people with that, but, but key, con key, key concept is what is protected health information? Realistically in public health, it's almost all the data we have, demographic, medical, diagnostic, uh, all that is protected health information and a covered entity, which again is almost all of us, uh, must be mindful that that protected health information is uh, expected to be, because we're covered entities, is expected to be confidential and we need to make our decisions 
uh, based on that. So uh, le leaving you with, with some questions to ask your boss and your IT people, are we covered entities? Are we transmitting public health information? Are we using good encryption? Do we have a business associate agreement that is a signed relationship with a, a, a technology provider, an email server, a, a set of software? And then uh, all of those tools that are available for you to do this. I want to stop, Bill. I think we are at that point. Questions or comments as we wrap up? Yes, Jim. First of all, uh, we had somebody who sent us the information on VPN. It's a virtual oh. private network. Thank you. Extends virtual a private problem. network across a public network and enables users to send and receive data across exactly. shared network exactly thank you bless whoever does vpn <laughs> is the safest way to have and some people at home have a vpn like like people are super cautious set up their own virtual private network thank you bill uh, a couple of comments i wanted to make first of all uh we're trying to expand our telehealth uh, program here at uh, april golson and her uh crew upstairs are working on doing that actually uh getting back into some stuff that we had put on hold due to the covid and so we're starting uh, to, to try, try to see patients again in our, in our clinics so that they can uh, get contact with their uh, physicians or, or mental health specialists uh, in other cities. And so we're glad to, that that's uh, getting started again. Uh, I mentioned this last on our last program. I'll mention it again. Our, our WIC patients seem to really enjoy the tele uh, communication. Uh, our numbers seem to be up. And so that's great. Uh, yeah, and so we're seeing more patients there, and so I'm glad to hear about, uh, glad that that's working out. And of course, you know, you mentioned North Carolina and the hollers and the, the back roads and whatnot. Uh, we have those here in Alabama as well, and so that's also also a, a, a challenge for us is, uh, you know, finding, uh, there are a lot of dead spots in, in the state of Alabama where you can't get cell service or, or internet service. And so, you know, that continues to be a problem here in Alabama and a challenge. So, and, and then bandwidth, you talk about that some too, and, and that's a, a big issue. Uh, as our schools are going virtual in some places, having enough bandwidth uh, for the students to be able to uh, get the education that they need uh, yeah. has been a challenge. So, yeah, uh, I've, got, I've gotten off the interstate bill down there in South Alabama and driven across over to Pensacola where my cousins live, and I promise I know. The, the ground is flat. There ain't no holler, but there are some real gaps in terms of the digital age when you get off into uh, southeast Alabama. Definitely. Washington County, even Covington County. I grew up in, in, in Delusia, so uh, there's some spots there that are uh, that are dead. So yeah. anyway, uh, other than that, that's, that seems to be all the comments we've got at the moment. Right. Okay. Well, let me just real quick then. Uh, I, I, I want to thank, we, we mentioned this, but, but uh, Bill and I, I, I want to sure to, to thank the Alabama Wise Woman Program, the R Rhonda Holland, the people that, that are with the Wise Woman Program, uh, excellent work out of the breast and cervical cancer prevention uh, unit within ADPH, uh, offering uh, screening and, and all kinds of good things uh, to prevent heart disease and other chronic health problems, manage diabetes and heart disease. So they've been kind enough to offer support. Um, my, my friends at, at ADPH, all, all the, the good people there, uh, Rhonda, uh, Bill, Ryan, Brandon, uh, Darren in the control room, and, and thanks to everybody who made time today. I know there were other things to do and there's probably emails and phone that piled up. Uh, I'm grateful that people made the time and I'm honored to have been part of this conversation. So thanks. Uh, again, to everybody, Bill, I'll turn it over to you to tell people how they get their CE credits. Thank you, Jim. Uh, again, thank you so much for this uh, topic. It's uh, some great information, some good uh, uh, things to think about. And so uh, this concludes our program today. I, and I want to thank you again, James, for being here. Uh, and I want to thank you for watching. I also want to thank Rhonda Holland with the Wise One for helping us uh, put these uh, programs on. Uh, please remember that you can refer back to the training uh, and resources anytime on our own demand through our uh, Alabama Public Health uh, Network uh, uh, internet. So with that said, have a great day.